Lord, we just thank you so much that we get to come here and, and just praise you and just be in your presence and celebrate you, Lord, that you did. You, you came from heaven to earth, Lord. You humbled yourself uh, from all your majesty and glory and power and might to become vulnerable, to become one of us so that we could draw near to you, Lord. You came all the way to us. And, th and that's the only point of the story that really matters, Lord, is you came all the way to us. And so, Lord, we just want to honor you and praise you today. Remember you as we celebrate the fact that you did. You came from heaven to earth to save a lost and wandering people. And we just thank you and give you praise, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Holly. Well, Merry Christmas again. We got more people. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Yeah, we missed it. We miss Christmas. If we're talking about the birth of Jesus, we missed it. You see, like, fun fact is, is that Jesus was probably actually born sometime in late September. If you look at the account of his cousin, John the Baptist, and when he was born and the timeline that's given at the feast and when he uh, came about, when his father found out that he was going to have a son in his old age, Zachariah, and then when Mary comes and when Mary has Jesus, it's probably somewhere late September, early October is when they believe Jesus was actually born. So why December 25th, right? It's one of those things that has been kind of debated for a long time of like, what is it about December 25th that, that led uh, church leaders at a certain point to say, this is the day that we're going to start celebrating the Lord's birth? Well, the most common thought up until the last century or so was with the, the evidence at hand and the thought at hand is that the early Christians were trying to fight a very, a very progressive culture in the Roman and Greek world and in some of the pagan religions as they're moving into Western Europe, that there was all these pagan religions and they had these festivals for the sun and for the harvest festivals. And they're always done at the end of the winter. And so that they thought that what the Christians did was that they actually came and they said, you know what, we're going to celebrate Jesus's birth to kind of counteract and give the Christians something to celebrate during that season. And that's been like the loudest, most proclaimed reason why Christmas has been December 25th for years. But what they found out is they found more documents of more ancient church literature is that really what probably happened, more likely, is that what they did is they looked at the passion. They looked at when Jesus was crucified. And they figured God in, in his wisdom and in just his creativity and his, his complete, you know, just awesomeness decided that well, what God would have done is he would have had Mary conceive Jesus at that time. And then nine months later, March 25th to December 25th, nine months later, Jesus would be born. And so what they think is that often, or what they believe is that it probably started in the Northern African church was a tradition of Christmas based around that thought that Jesus was probably conceived the very same day that his spirit left the world. He was probably came into it 33 years prior. And so that's how we've ended up with Christmas on December 25th. We missed it. So many of our traditions are pagan, though. Like one of my favorites is the Christmas tree. We go into the woods and we kill a beautiful tree and then we decorate in our home and we force it to stay alive for weeks or months on end until it starts losing all its needles. It's actually a Druid pagan tradition from Western Europe where they used to worship the forest and the trees and they would go in and they'd decorate trees. And so this is actually very much a pagan tradition that we celebrate at Christmas, the whole Christmas tree. We missed it. But it's crazy. I mean, Christmas is just a crazy time of year. Um, we miss what Christmas is about regardless if we know or don't know why we celebrate on December 25th or even if we, we don't know Jesus. And we just miss the point of Christmas all the time. It, it's just busy all the time. I mean, Christmas can drive you nuts. This time of year is overflowing. I mean, all the traveling and eating, dressing up, eating, giving gifts, receiving gifts, and more eating. You get with friends and family and eating. You, uh, you get with more family, then you start drinking. There's all sorts of things at Christmas. It just gets nuts, and it can be just hard. It can be overwhelming. It's not like life stops either, right? It's not like, oh, we get ready for Christmas from Thanksgiving on, and we just we stop work. We let the kids raise themselves. We don't clean the house, and it stays magically clean. It's like all this extra stress, all this decorating, all this preparation from Christmas. And in our culture, I mean, it's, it's Halloween. It's Thanksgiving. It's Christmas. I mean, this is just a season of just craziness, and life doesn't stop. I mean, cleaning your house, forget it. I'll clean my house next year. You know, January 3rd, 30th, March, 
sometime get around to cleaning the house after all the festivities. The tree is hanging dead. The, 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 <laughs> the needles are falling everywhere. And it's like, oh my gosh, at this point, I want to move it. It's just going to explode all over the house. I mean, it's just a crazy time. And it's like we're coping with all the stress, all the decorations, all the eating, all the eating, all the eating. It's like, oh my gosh, put up lights because they look good. Put the tree in the house and burn the candles because it smells good. And food, please, Lord, more good food because I just, I'm so stressed. I just need to taste something good. And so Christmas can just be crazy. It's constant celebration. It's constant family. And there's so much fun and joy at Christmas season. But I mean, it's nuts. And it's so easy to lose the purpose of why we even get together and celebrate. It's so easy to completely lose the power of this season. Jesus, the hope of the world, God on high, God with us, Emmanuel. That God would come from heaven in his lofty place, a perfect God would come into his fallen creation, his rebellious creation, and he would actually inject himself willingly into our circumstances. God with us, Emmanuel. We miss it. But you know what? The first Christmas story was probably crazier than just about any of us have ever experienced at Christmas. And I've had some pretty crazy Christmases with my mother's side of the family. But the first Christmas was just nuts for a young couple. We're going to look at Luke 2, starting in verse 3. This is the story of Mary and Joseph and the time when Jesus was born. And so Joseph and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. No place for them in the inn. This word in the Greek is kataluma, and it can be translated an inn, a lodging place, or even a dining room. You have to understand the vulnerability of these two kids. You know, we think nowadays, you know, I got married at 30. We probably won't have kids until my mid-30s. I mean, that's kind of normal now. I mean, these, they were kids. There, there is no reason to believe in this culture, in this day and age, that Joseph and Mary were any older than 17 years old at this point. Kids. And in this culture, a young woman to have a child out of wedlock when she was betrothed to somebody was something that could be punishable by death. And for Joseph to take this young woman and continue to be faithful and say, I'm going to marry you and I'm going to raise this child as my own because I believe what God told you and what God told me about this child would be a complete disgrace to the entire family. Kids, scared, probably broke, trying to figure this out. And he has to go to Bethlehem to go get registered, to, to be accounted for. And the truth is, is this idea of an inn, this lodging, this, this place of gathering was probably a family member's house, honestly. We get this idea that it was some innkeeper, like it was a business, like a hotel. But the truth is, is that the Jewish culture is very family related. And so they go to this inn and they get rejected by their own family and they get left down where the animals are. And it wasn't so much that they were rejected from their family in the sense that the family shut the door in their face, but it was almost just as bad. You see, in the Jewish Custom, if you had a house like this, a place that could be established in such a way, what you do is you would have a bottom floor, and the bottom floor would be where the animals would stay in the cool of the night, and their manger, which would be where they would get fed out of, would be in the bottom and down on the dirt floor, and above it would be all the rooms for living and the kitchen and where everyone, the dining room, the Cataluma would be upstairs. And so you can almost picture that this young couple who's already shamed in their family are traveling all this way from Nazareth all the way to Bethlehem, and they get to, to Joseph's family, and they go, hey, look, can we stay here while the census is happening? Why? Well, we're being registered and accounted for. And they go, look, you sinners, you two who have brought shame to our family, we'll let you in, but you stay downstairs with the donkeys. You stay downstairs with, with the sheep and maybe the dog. A pregnant young woman. I mean, how much shame do you have to bring on your family when you come pregnant, bursting, about to give birth, and your family says, downstairs with the fecal matter, with the feed, with the dirt in the cold by yourself because you're not welcome upstairs. There's no room for you. 
I think sometimes we can see possibly God as almost that same response as we look at ourselves in the mirror and we listen to the lies of the world or maybe even people in the church have lied to you about who you are and what your value is. As you can come to God and and you're searching for God, as, as you're drawing near to God, it's like climbing this mountain and it's like you just feel like there's no room for me. I I don't fit in in God's story. There's no room at the end. There's no room at the dining table. There's no room where we're lounging and being a family. There's no room for me. They were vulnerable. Two teenagers scared. And Mary gives birth, swaddles little baby Jesus up and puts him in the feeding trough to lay him there. Could you imagine how disgraced you would feel in your family if you were downstairs giving birth and Anybody that's been around a birth knows there's no way the people upstairs didn't hear it. And no one comes to see if you need anything. You're all alone. You're completely rejected now. There is life being brought forth in the earth and no one seems to care from your own family. And then you get a knock on the door. Again, remember, you're teenagers. You get a knock on the door from outside and who oh, who could it be? Maybe it's another family. And you open the door and there's three shepherds. There's something you need to understand about shepherds in Jesus' time and and day and age is that they were like the lowest of the low. If you could have a job and be distrusted as much while still keeping a job, that's what that job would be. I've been racking my brain. I was like, not that construction worker that's at the bar every day after work. Is it is it the fisherman that comes back after being on sea and he's just looking for a good time and you can't trust him? But like we're talking about men who in their society were looked at as like they were a step up from a criminal, and many of them were criminals who just hadn't gotten caught. That's how they were viewed. Gypsies. You know, like they were just dirty people. You're a teenager. You're, your bride-to-be is just giving birth to a child that's not yours. You're being shamed by your family. You're in the dark, cold, down with the animals. And then three dudes who are scruffy and dirty because they've been staying outside all fall with sheep knock on your door and go, we want to see your pipe. We want to see your baby. Can we come in and check, up, check out this little baby? Vulnerable. Vulnerable situation for a young couple to be. So scary. And so they, they open the door and these three, these three shepherds come in and they worship the baby Jesus and completely blow it away. And it says that Mary, in verse 19 of Luke 2, says that Mary held all these things close to her heart about what they were saying and proclaiming about her child. And then sometime within two years, this young couple going back to Nazareth, a part of J- Judea that was just not well respected, within two years, whether probably at home, probably not still in Bethlehem, they, they, they get three wise men from a foreign country come to see them and shower gifts on him, and praise the Lord again. But then they get a word from the Lord to me, and says, run. Probably less than 20 years old, little screaming infant, time to run, because Herod's going to kill your baby. And they run all the way to a foreign country. So you have two kids, you know, out on the lamb, down, down now in Egypt, hiding out, waiting for this, this time to pass. Scared, vulnerable. What has God done to us? Are you kidding me? This is supposed to be a gift. The Son of God brought to us. Oh, you are ruining my life, Lord. This child has been nothing but causing vulnerability for both of them socially, economically, even in their very lives in danger because of his existence. But the baby himself is vulnerable. I mean, think about God, God on high. Almighty God who can speak creation into existence. All of a sudden decides, you know what? I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up as an infant. What's more vulnerable and approachable than a newborn child? They can't do anything to you. They, they have to be received. I mean, if I were God, I would want to show up. I mean, you know, part the heavens, like cataclysmic, just earth shaking, just everyone stop, the thunder, just the world shakes. And then it's like that lightning bolt comes out of the sky, and just boom, sizzles. And there's God coming up. <laughs> yeah, I'd come as Terminator. Just level things, have Superman powers and just level things. Well, it's a good thing I'm just chubby and in a jingly sweater and not God. I can't do none of that. God doesn't come like that. God doesn't come looking to wreak havoc on his creation that's rebelled against him for thousands of years. He doesn't come to just shatter the foundations of everything with his force and power, although he could. He comes completely humbly as a baby. What a neat picture of a God that says, I love you so much. I'm going to come in the form in which you will be the least scared. Could have come in power. But he comes as a small child. 
And he allows the bottom of society to come to him and worship him freely. And he allows the top of society that doesn't even know about him from afar to come and worship him freely. Emmanuel, God with us. God is not a respecter of persons, of nationalities, of gender, of creed. He is coming and He has welcomed all to come and worship Him as He is and the truth of who He is, but He welcomes all regardless of their background of life and their understanding. They all can come and worship Jesus. The beauty of Christmas is that anyone can come to Jesus and find God, but even more importantly, that when you come to Jesus, you can be found by God. It's one thing to know about God, but it's another thing to be found and called by name by the creator of the universe. And that is why God came. But we miss this so often that God, Emmanuel, God with us, is the purpose and the beauty of Christmas, that God didn't sit on his throne in heaven from afar. He interjected himself personally into our very lives in the most humble, vulnerable way he could so that we could approach him with boldness and confidence. Our series Drawing Near to God drawing near to us has been dealing with this idea that sometimes it feels like a mountain. We have this, Nate came up with this idea of this awesome mountain in the backdrop and kind of this water, ice looking flow down here. Uh, Taylor and Nate kind of had some ideas that they came together for this, this theme for tonight. Building out of our, our series of God drawing near to us, drawing, God, <laughs> drawing near to God, drawing near to us. Heart and soul is kind of hidden in the mountain because we often miss that the point of drawing near to God and Him coming to us is always about the heart and the soul. It's always about the internal part. But what we see is we see this jagged mountain. We see this thing that we can't climb that looks treacherous and dangerous. And oftentimes that's what God seems like. It seems like this God that we try to draw near to, this God that we worship or that we're seeking right now in our lives, trying to figure more about that He's at this mountaintop. He has, there's this understanding that you got to have or there's this, this way of living or these rules that you got to accomplish, these set this blueprint to your life that you've got to figure out if you're going to be able to reach this God, if you're going to know this God and be received by this God. And the truth is, is God on Christmas just completely obliterates any of that. And you find Him at the bottom of the mountain looking for your heart and soul. God with us, Emmanuel. We try so hard in so many ways, and even if we know that it's by grace, the free gift of God's grace, Jesus' blood on the cross and His resurrection that saves us, we can still get wrapped in this idea that i got to do something to reach God. If i got to make God happy by doing something. And we forget what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 3, verse 23. That's Romans 5. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned, all have missed the mark, all have rebelled in some way, all have not been able to summit the pinnacle of God and His perfection, and have fallen short. We couldn't draw near to God. None of us could. None of us can. None of us ever will be able to draw near to God in our own strength and understanding. And so, Emmanuel, God with us, He came to us. God became as vulnerable to us as a baby as we are to Him by choice. In all His power and might, there's nothing we can do to thwart Him, to stop Him, to come against Him. And in the same way, he came as a child, a newborn child, completely dependent on two scared teenage kids who had seen angels. Crazy. Christmas is crazy. It's crazy to think about and it's crazy to believe. But why would an all-powerful God be so vulnerable to us? Why would he come with such humility to us, a rebellious people? Why wouldn't he come in power? It's his love for us. John 3.16, the verse that so many of us have heard in and out of church. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. You have to understand that God is madly in love with you. Any thoughts you have about God being mad at you, about your life choices, about who you are, that He despises you, He's looking to punish you, looking to shame you, looking to show you how wrong you are, you got to get that out of your mind. God came and became vulnerable for us, not because He needed to, not only to show us the right way to live, but because He desperately wants a relationship with us. See, Christmas is this, this picture of the baby Jesus, a vulnerable God coming to us in such a way, saying, I, I love you so much that I'm going to even give my very life into your hands. That's why He created us, is to love us. 
That's why he came up to us, is so that we could be in relationship with him. And that's why he died for us and rose again, is so that we could continue that relationship for all eternity. Because of his mad, crazy, unexplainable, unmeasurable, unsearchable love for each and every person, regardless of where you come from. He sent his only son, the only truth and way and life, Jesus Christ. That word Cataluma that I mentioned, the inn, the dining hall, the upper room, the lodging place. Luke talks about it again later in Luke 22 about the Last Supper. And so we see Jesus coming into a house, not being allowed into the upper room, into the supper room. As a child, he comes completely vulnerable uh, to everything. And then he makes himself vulnerable 33 years later in, in the same kind of place in Jerusalem in the upper room. And I want to look at John 13, what Jesus does when he actually reaches the upper room. In verse 1, it says that, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were with the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas as a chariot, Simon's son to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had had come from God, and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. There's something that I want you guys to see in this imagery is Jesus coming vulnerable as a baby and allowing the worst of the worst and the best of the best to come to him and receive him and worship him. But when Jesus comes back around 33 years later, not to the same house, but to the same situation, and God's very particular about the words he chooses in his word, something beautiful happens. The vulnerability gets shown from God in a different way. Not only does he receive us as we are, but he gives all of himself to us on the second time around in the inn where there was no room and now there's room for him and all his friends. You see, what Jesus did was something that not even Jewish servants or slaves were allowed to do, which is wash the feet of people. In their culture and their custom, because of what was on the ground, all the dirt, all the fecal matter, you have to remember, this is a third world country. There's no cement. There's no indoor plumbing for them. And so people walked around open-toed sandals and, and everything that was on the ground from food to animal matter, everything got on your feet throughout the day. The feet were the dirtiest part of the human body. And Jesus, a master, a Jewish master, declosed himself, which first of all is a huge disgrace for a man of integrity and honor like that to take off his robe and wraps a towel around himself, gets on his hands and knees and starts washing the feet. A slave, a Jewish slave, was considered too high a position to do this work. The vulnerability of Jesus, his love for us to show that not only do I receive you where I am, but I'm going to completely humiliate myself and everything that society says about what a God king should look like. I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to take all your dirt away. I'm going to wipe your feet clean with this towel. What Jesus is showing his disciples when he's saying to us today is like, I love you so much. I'm going to take all your dirt away. I want to take all your sin. I want to take all your hopelessness. I want to take all your pain, all your fear, all your doubt. I want, to, I want to wash it away. I'm here today to wash it away because I'm coming to you vulnerably. I'm not shaking the heavens and the earth right now. I'm coming to you because I love you and I'm coming to you tenderly to take it all away from you. My life for yours so that we can do this life together. When the world didn't want him in the manger, he received them anyways. And when the world didn't want him and killed him, he got down on his knees and he served us. This is a God who will take you where you're at and he will take every dirty thing you have ever done, every thought, every intention of your heart, and he will make you clean because he loves you. And the irony of this and the irony of Christmas, maybe the one thing we kind of get right at Christmas is gifts. This idea of gifts. You see, salvation and life in Christ is a free gift. You can't earn it. You can't climb that mountain. I can't climb that mountain. No one can climb that mountain to get to God. It is a free gift. And just like a gift at Christmas, I mean, you don't, you don't sit around on Christmas morning or Christmas Eve and give a gift and go, that gift's worth $50. I'll expect three hours of labor and a thank you card and all this when you're done. I mean, if you do, we need to talk about your family dynamics. 
That's messed up. A gift. It's free. It's because I love you. You're part of my family. I love you. I'm giving this to you for free. It's a gift. Salvation. Life now in Christ. God in you. God with you. Emmanuel is a gift. You can't pay for it. You can't earn it. You can't pay it back. You got to receive it. And then you got to receive the gift itself for its purpose, which is the life of yours replaced with the life of Christ, fully submitted. That verse, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What a downer on Christmas. But then verse 24, and, and are justified, that means all wrongs made right, everything put in order by His grace, His unmerited favor and love, His grace as a gift. You have been made right before God as a gift, not something to earn. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus and nothing else. Oh, the generosity of God. I'm going to read you a long section of Scripture before we, as we get ready to close out. It's one of my favorite sections of Scripture that talks about who we are in the heart of God and what He's done. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. I'm going to drink some water so I don't foam up everywhere. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all, all of us, once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and of the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with Him and seated with Him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages He might show the immeasurable riches of His grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. For we are all His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should just walk in them. You see, the beauty of Christmas is that God bankrupted heaven to give you everything of Him as a gift. He bankrupted all of heaven to send His Son to us so that we could have the Holy Spirit in us, so that we can have life eternal, a relationship with the Creator of the universe for all time. He gave it all. The greatest gift any of us can have and acknowledge in this Christmas season, in any day of the year, is the fact that we can claim Jesus as our Lord and Savior and God of our life, the Redeemer of our souls, the forgiver of all our sins. Jesus is the greatest gift we've ever got and we could ever receive. So as we're closing, I'm going to ask everyone to just bow their heads with me right now. It's a gift. I mean, I could stand up here and just say it over and over and use analogies, but it's a gift. If you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's real simple. It's acknowledging Him for who He is and accepting Him as He is into your life as your Lord and Savior. The forgiveness of sins and the receiving of His life for yours. When we confess in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we receive the gift of life, that free gift. That's that's how you open up your arms to receive the gift of Jesus. And so tonight, if you want for the first time in your life to receive the gift of eternal life, of life abundant now in this life and forevermore, I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand. I want to pray with you. I see you. It's real simple. I see you. All right, well, we're going to do this as a family. We're going to pray. We're going to pray out loud. So you guys are just going to repeat after me. 
And if this is you receiving Jesus, you just have to believe it in your heart and speak it with your mouth. God hears you and he knows your heart and you are his. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you came and died and you rose again. Lord, I am a sinner and I need you to forgive me for all I've done. Jesus, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And I just give you my life and I take yours instead. Thank you, Lord. I give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So what we're going to do now is a fun tradition. Jesus and John, John 8, 12 says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so what we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to light some candles and we're going to sing one last song. It's kind of an old tr- Christmas tradition. And uh, the girls are going to come down the aisle and they're going to light your candles for you. And I just want your hearts to, to just understand the heart of God as we start to sing and worship the Lord, um, what God has intended for you in this relationship. Hebrew 4, 14 through 16 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus. The Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession, that confession of faith we all just made. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet he is without sin. Let us then with confidence, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. God is here to help you tonight. The greatest gift he's ever given is his life. And it is powerful and it is real and it is active now. And so as you sing, give over any of your needs, any of your worries. As you look at that light, God is with us. The light represents the light of Christ. He is drawn near. Emmanuel, God with us. And give over anything that you need to give over because God is here right now to meet you, to give you the gift of life this Christmas. And then I'll come close this out after this song. Well, it's too bad you guys can't be up here. It looks really cool. <laughs> Uh, tonight, as you guys go home, I, I just pray, and I pray this for myself, that we don't walk out that door and get caught up in the craziness, that we can make it. The world makes it, but we can make Christmas so much about us and the craziness of, of just all these traditions. But the fact is that we have life in Christ, and that that is the most amazing gift and the most amazing thing we can hold on to. The disciples were sent out to go cast out demons, heal the sick, and preach the gospel of the good news. And uh, they came back and like, Lord, Lord, the sick were healed and, and the demons left at our command. And Jesus goes, no, no, no. Be thankful and grateful that your names are written in the book of life. Be thankful and know that you're part of my family. Be thankful and know that you have the gift of salvation this, this Christmas season. And go out and bless somebody. It's so much greater to give than to receive. And if you if you didn't get a chance at the beginning, no people came in late. We are giving to the Syrian and Jordanian refugees. If you want to give, come talk to myself, Pastor Jason at the back, or Bob, who you saw, um, give the wonderful presentation about what's going on over there and why we're giving all of our offering this Christmas to the people over there and what they're going through. Uh, if you want to give to that, come talk to one of us right now after service. And if you want to talk about your relationship with Christ, if you came to to a relationship with Jesus tonight. I'd love to talk to you, and so come find me. And so let's pray before uh, we get too much wax on our fingers. (laughs) Lord, we thank you that you came to us as a vulnerable baby. And as a king, God, you made yourself vulnerable all the way to death on a cross because of your great love for us. Jesus, we thank you and we praise you, our Lord, our God. We just pray that you would be blessed by our lives as we go forward, and that you would continue to bless us with your presence and your Holy Spirit. And we thank you and give you glory and honor. Amen. Merry Christmas, you guys. Be blessed.